Hi, I'm Mauro Porcini, PepsiCo's Chief Design Officer. Join me for our new series where we dive into the minds of the greatest innovators of our time, with the goal of finding what drives them in their professional journey and in their personal life. Trying to uncover the universal truths that unite anyone attempting to have a meaningful impact in the world. This is In Your Shoes. I will never launch a label today without taking sustainability and social responsibility into consideration. I'm quoting my guest of today. She is the granddaughter of Ottavio and Rosita Missoni, who founded her family's legendary fashion house in 1953. Having grown up in the Italian countryside of Varese, she began working as an ambassador for Missoni in her teens. While being the face of Missoni, she studied philosophy at the Università degli Studi di Milano at the Columbia University in New York, where she lived until 2009, while also part-time acting. In spring of that year, she began getting involved with a brand on a deeper level, becoming part of the design team and following in the steps of her mother, Angela, the Maison's creative director. In 2010, she was appointed as the accessory director of Missoni. After five years, she left to create a children's wear collection of her own, Margherita Kids, as well as working on several collaborations, including suitcases with away furniture with pottery barn kids, swimsuits with Mock 50, and women's apparel with Splendid. In 2018, she was named M. Missoni Creative Director, with a mission to give a new identity to the Missoni's little sister. She terminated her tenure in March 2021. A powerful, beloved ambassador of her native country, she received the America Award from the Italy USA Foundation in 2014 for her work in helping improve the relationship between America and Italy. Margherita Maccapani Missoni, welcome to In Your Shoes. Margherita, it's such a pleasure to have you with us today. Grazie, Mauro. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. So Margherita and I come from the same city in the north of Italy, from Varese, actually from two little towns uh, in, in Varese, uh, two different towns. But Margherita, Margherita was, what is your town? I grew up in Montonate. Um, it's a small village of, when I was young, 600 inhabitants. Um, so really, really tiny uh, village. And, and from Montonate, 600 people, you ended up at a certain point in your life in New York, what I call the capital of the capitals, millions of people from all around the world. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the journey. How did it happen? The epitome of the city. Um, yeah, I, so I, I grew up in the countryside in this very provincial, you know, Italian province, small village life. But on the other hand, I had the fashion world, which was really very much part of my life, where I was uh, meeting extravagant people um, with extravagant lifestyles. And um, I think the, the balance has been really healthy for me. I think it really um, kept me grounded in a way that, um, you know, I could, have got, I could have gotten lost so many times. And uh, I'm really, really rooted in that, in that, um, in that place. Um, I must admit though, that growing up, I could, was really longing for the city lights. And I told once my mom, I told her, please, at least for holidays, can you take us to, to a city? So as soon as I could, when I was 18, I left, I, I went to Milan, which was the closest big city, enrolled in, um, university studying philosophy then I spent six months in Spain um, to then uh, transfer to Columbia University in New York which was a great school but the reason uh, for my transfer was that really my goal was going to New York which represented you know the the, the cityest of them all and um, I have to say I, I had the worst time the first six months. I was miserable. I was really depressed. It was freezing. University was so different than what I was used to. Wouldn't leave my apartment. And everybody was like, come home. Don't worry. You know, it's an experience. 
but I didn't want to go home and I wanted to make it in New York. <laughs> okay, how did it go? Which, the first six months were tough. And then what changed in, in, in your life? In you this? know, um, first of all, well, I was studying philosophy and I was doing it out of duty in a way. I was always a really good student and my grandmother um, had this desire for me to graduate in something like philosophy or literature because I was writing well. And she was not allowed. My grandmother was not allowed to go to university. I mean, not allowed. Her mother told her, you're not going to go because what if you marry a man who's not graduated? <laughs> Can you imagine? So then she met my grandfather who couldn't have cared less, but you know, or, <laughs> um, so she had this thing where I was a good student. It would have been easy for me to do it, but all I wanted to do at the time was acting. You know, I wanted to run away from, I wanted to run away from everything that was there because I needed to find was there. I mean, in Varese, what we're saying in, in Sumirago for me, which is where the Missoni headquarters are based next to my village and where my grandmother is. I needed to find out who I was as a single being, you know, not like just one branch of a tree. And, um, in order to do that, I needed to move away. So moving to a, a faraway place and, doing something completely different and uh, and i thought i wanted to be an actress so that uh, my mother convinced me at that point she was like you're going to leave university is making you really unhappy it's not what you want to be doing she sent my small my 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 young sis my youngest sister to new york who was i mean i was 21 so she was 16 to take me to school and <laughs> cancel everything and I started studying acting and suddenly it was spring and I was doing something that I loved you know how things like all come together at one point and uh and so at that point it was like I'm definitely coming back after you know I was going to go home for the summer and then and then come back and then when I came back I moved uh I, I was living at Upper East Side at first and then I moved I moved to uh, Soho uh, at that time, or, you know, uh, Sullivan Street. I lived in two different places on Sullivan Street. And, um, yeah, it was. And, and, and then you, so in that period, you wanted to be an actress. And then instead, later on in your life, you enter back the design world and i say back in reality be because you come from a design a fashion design family but you were not a designer back then and then yeah. you decided to change that so, what, so what really happened is that i so i was acting and acting is a lot about looking inside of yourself and dwelling in past experiences it's a lot like an, an analysis you know which is what I was seeking. And I realized, you know, afterwards that that's what I was seeking. And um, um, I stopped at one point. I, rem I remember I was like always, and I was in, you know, small productions, theaters. I was always in the back of these theaters in the dark. And at one point it hit me and I was like, the world is happening outside, you know? I, and, and I'm closed in here, living the past, and I could be living the present outside. I really wanted to live at that point life. And it was probably, you know, I was more comfortable with myself. I knew who I was. I knew where I ended and the, the others began. And, um, and that's when I admitted to myself, I was like, what I, what I really like doing, what I'm really good at is designing. You know, that's, I was staying away from it um, because, you know, I had to go around and, and, and realize that I liked it, not that it was there uh, written down already uh, in my path. It's, it's almost yeah. like a novel from Coelho. You do this journey yeah, and then exactly. sooner or later you go back to where you but came that, from, but you, you, you grew. Completely. But the point of the whole thing is the journey. I, th I mean, 
Yeah. It's not like the, right. The, the destination or the objective is like, and it's, and every job, play, time you think it's a destination, it, then you realize it's actually part of the journey because it's serving you to go somewhere else. So uh, definitely I, I realized that I was extremely blessed by the fact that they, my family let me live through this path of mine experience without pushing me or pulling, it, pulling me in different directions. And by that, I went, I did all my steps and I went back, you know, even choosing, I chose Varese again after leaving in, in Spain, America, uh, Paris, and then Rome. And then, and then I went back to Varese and I married a, a guy <laughs> from Varese. <laughs> a common friend, Eugenio. Ciao, Eugenio. And, uh, but uh, you, you mentioned multiple times your roots. And the roots are the city, but it's also the family. Uh, your, your family is somehow an anomaly, if you want, in the fashion world, meaning that there is this heavy presence of the family, the grandma and before your grandfather and your mother, Angela. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful story uh, that you're very proud to share in so many different situations, uh, official and less official. How important is being the family in your life, in your journey, but also in what you do every day. So the family is really very central, but with, like with every kind of social, um, social structure or social uh, organization, it brings advantages and, uh, you know, disadvantages. So it's definitely a net where you can bounce on, you know, you fail and there is like unconditional acceptance and love. And that's growing up. Um, it, it's, it's very valuable because it, um, it gives you confidence, you know, that, um, it's great. On the other hand, what it's, you know, you're always um, tied to it and your decisions are never, well, freedom in a way is, um, is restricted. You know, you have to make compromises. Um, decisions are collective. They're not individualist, in, individ, individualist? Individual. Or, or individual. individual, yeah. 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 It, and, and it's, it's interesting how you define it as a, as a net or a safety net also, if you yeah, want. Yeah, for sure. And, and you, you mentioned uh, this idea of, of failure, you know, uh, uh, every time anybody, any person, any company wants to innovate, change the status quo by definition, sooner or later, we will fail in a, in a way or the other. I actually prefer to call these failures experiments. <laughs> they are part of the innovation process, yeah. innovating your life, innovating a brand or a product. Is how, how, how did you manage failures or like these experiments in your life? Is there any specific example or in general, what is your relation with the idea of experimentation slash failure? No, but it's a, it's very it's it's a very difficult thing to learn to digest uh, and accept failure. Like I, I grew up wanting to be the best. Like you know, it was my sole objective. I wanted to be the first one. It's always and. Um, it gave me a lot of satisfaction. That's why I was a good student. I really enjoyed being the first in my class. I enjoyed the applause. That's why I also liked acting. So admitting failure is really like, um, it's a process of one of the, I, I really realize I've grown up when I see how I deal with it now versus how I dealt with it 20 years ago, then I really see the process of growth because it has been a, a, a 
a path definitely i wasn't i wasn't i wasn't accepting at all failure it was much harder to admit failure than to go through it in a way you know oh yeah Oh yeah. I, I love how, you know, looking back and looking at things in perspective, you can yeah. really appreciate the journey and the growth. Uh, often I think the difficulty in life is that you live day by day and you don't pause and step back and see how much, you know, you're As, being uh, how much has changed. That, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we need to do this effort to really appreciate where we are and find new energy to grow even more. And, and, and learn yeah more. and and i always i always say you know i looking back when i think of, for example when i go to new york now which i have so many feelings and it's feelings for that little girl that was me that was there that i really care for and love you know it's but it's another person i mean it's still me but it's like completely different i almost get emotional <laughs> no it's true <laughs> every time i arrive from the airport i have this like melancholic yeah and, and talking about family uh, your last name uh, and coming from your 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 mother that part of the family is a is a very iconic name, yeah. not just in Italy, in the world, in the fashion world. And as we said earlier, you enter the certain point, the, the, the family business, let's call it in this way, as a designer yeah. in, in different roles. Um, what has been your design creative interpretation of the brand over the years? I, I, I know you have been playing with the past and the heritage and then with elements from the future. Yeah. What's your philosophy? What so, has been your philosophy for the brand? First few years I worked under my mother. I was doing some of uh, accessories and licensing under her direction. And then a few years ago, uh, Missoni received an in investment funding. And um, the people who came in asked me to take over this collection that was a license for us before that had become our own and it was called M. Missoni. And so this was a, a cheaper line, let's say, right? Which didn't have its own identity before. It was a, a less expensive, easier version of Missoni. And... Um, so my idea was to use these as a as a tool to tell the world about the Missoni B side, the unplayed songs, all the leftovers from the Missoni history that didn't make it big at the time, but could be very relevant for right now. So our motto was reuse remix respect and so by reusing okay. it was reusing stocks of yarns and fabrics or prints uh that didn't became iconic but also reusing ideas so um uh, mantras that misoni had uh or uh, things that happen right reusing it but then remixing it because we would never take something flat out from the past, copy paste it and make it. We would always twist it inside out, upside down, use it, using it for a different purpose that it was originally meant to. Um, so for example, we took out all the um, old Missoni collaborations with the cars and candies in the 80s and use them as prints for t-shirts and then um, respect because at the same time really um, respecting the heritage and uh, and always keeping in mind what Missoni was um, and also respecting the world and so the whole collection um, was really thought out to be um, sustainable. So we had uh, all the yarns we used were either recycled or uh, upcycled, meaning from the stocks or uh, bio-certificated, et cetera, et cetera. But I think, I mean, I think that's just whoever would start 
a brand in this time would, I, mean, I don't think that was something special, you know, that I really want to talk about, but I just think it's normal to do that. Um, and so, yes, that was the idea. And so, for example, the first uh, presentation we did, um, we did it in Milan on a cable car because I had found in the archive these images of musicians in the 80s playing, um, dressed in Missoni, playing in a cable car. And, um, and I thought that was really representative of what I wanted to do because I wanted to make with that collection I didn't want it to have a, a high, I, we didn't have a high fashion ambition. It was about different pieces to fill in a wardrobe of like, of your daily life. So, and to make it more fun, because I really thought that something that would, passion is lacking and was lacking. And now it's a bit different because everything has changed, but you know, it was uh, lightness and fun, you know, everything had become so pretentious. You're designing 10 dresses and making a full show for it that gets lost in the middle. So I decided to uh, have the guests on a cable car and the models walking on and off at different stops around town. And um, that's an example of how we reuse the past in a, in a different way. I love it. And you mentioned sustainability. Sustainability was part of it. Actually, when you hear the motto, immediately sustainability comes to mind. You mentioned some of the things you were doing, but what do you think is the, should be, should be the future of fashion in general, yeah. beyond Missoni? Fashion is one of the most polluting industry in the world yeah. from production all the way to the fact. And then I'm the worst offender of the fact that we keep buying new stuff. So yeah. what do you think, how fashion should evolve in the next 20 years? So I am really convinced. I support the idea that fashion should go through uh, the same kind of change, collective set of mind change that the food industry went through in the past 20 years, right? So the concept of organic, not everyone is ready to spend more to eat organic, but almost everyone is aware of the meaning and, you know, what it stands for. It's like a stamp. Yeah. So I think we all need to get together and create some sort of concept that will communicate that in fashion because I think that will be a good, um, you know, way to part the waters on one side and the other one, you know, for sure, fast fashion is, uh, something hard to get around, you know, it's hard for me to get around my head around it and justify it. And, uh, um, I hope, I mean, I've been hoping and I'm still positive that this past year will, has made a change on a lot of, a lot of people, but you know, who knows, we have been getting together, uh, different groups. I mean, different people in fashion under, um, you know, to, to, to find a common path to, to, to propose changes. We've been discussing different delivery times. We've been discussing getting together, um, to ask retailer, you know, for specific uh, windows of uh, full price, different different rules that we are trying to to enact. But it's a long, it's it's not a, 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 day, a nice today kind of process. Yeah, I agree. I love the fact that you talk about this initial need for awareness, even before anything else, mm. and the parallel with with because the, the concept that there, I mean. If you have this in your hand, it's because someone spent, I don't know, 15 hours embroidering it, you know, or, or just uh, sewing it or shoe, you know, like it's, it, that concept is not common in people. They just think because fashion, you know, it's luxury and fashion companies earn a lot of money. There's the idea that it's, n it, it's not for the work. It's not for the artisanship that it's in it, right? Yeah. Which is something that we need to find a way to communicate. It's also tricky because within the same company, you will have 
you will have uh, items that are almost uh, sartorially made. And then, you know, wallets made in bulk uh, that will not go through the certificate. That's why it's difficult to uh, really get together and, um, and work on something like that. But I definitely think that's the way to go. I, I totally agree. I, I, for me, it's been very interesting to witness in the past nine years since I joined my industry here in PepsiCo, the, the food and beverage industry, the amplified attention on the topics of sustainability in the past two years, especially almost every, yeah, almost every company in the industry, there is a new attention. There is hundreds of millions of dollars collected, invested to really change things. So that's why I, I really love your message because I do think that from few individuals starting to do things and building awareness, slowly you can create because a movement. That then can in the end, it's them. always demand, you know, yeah. demand that drives the, the, drives the, 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 the trends. Yeah. So if, the awareness triggers demands, even everyone has to follow. Yeah. And I think especially new generations that are building their behaviors and they're trying to find their identity, often in this phase, often is against the previous generations. You know, yeah. they want to be different. And, and, they, and they think we can leverage that physiological and spiritual need of these generations to really accelerate even more sustainability, health and awareness that you yeah. mentioned earlier. And, and, I am and many sure other that, positive values. that the new generation has a completely different uh, sensibility than us, yeah. more innate, more, uh, you know, deeper. Yeah. Well, by the way, we are growing up. You know, I still feel like a kid. You're younger than me, but we are growing up and step by step we are starting to detach from these young generations and, and you have uh, yeah. kids. Uh, you, I think your kids can help you keeping you, you know, connected to, to the younger generation. I don't have them yet. So, uh, you know, you feel that, where do you find your inspiration today? How do you stay connected to, to what's going on in the world and especially with the younger generations and the new trends and everything is happening out there? I think to me, it's always been, you know, you're always inspired from every, anything that you see. If you're creative, you get inspired from anything, but that's why I think it's really important to make efforts, conscious efforts to go out and see people and, and travel and go to shows and, and keep up to date with the musical scene and everything. Cause the more you're exposed, the more you'll be inspired in that direction but it's definitely a conscious effort not just towards a young generation but towards the world in general i agree well talking about non the young generations and the world in general i remember i may be wrong but i remember you had a passion also for the little markets right you go yeah, to yeah. the vintage markets of course, and we everything. went together <laughs> yes, <No? What? laughs> in New York. Yes, so so you you love that too. Why do you like them? What what happened there when you go there? That's really like something that I inherited from my mom and my grandma. It's really our family activity that we do together. You know how on Sundays we we do that. Um, the joy of counting something unexpected out of a junk it's just for me it's like you know for the mushroom uh, pick, uh, picker the <laughs> um i i actually for me in new york i love but it's almost too polished i much prefer the varese you know province a dirty Sunday market where you can scout, uh, a, I don't know, a Venini vase that nobody, re you know, knows in the middle of electrical yarns and wires. And, um, yeah, I definitely, I mean, we, we were talking about it the other day and we cannot keep piling up. We need to start selling this stuff. So <laughs> we will have to like create some sort of, um, a vintage uh, reseller soon. You know, I 
I, my house in the Hamptons is becoming more and more of a museum full, full of stuff that I buy all around the world. And I'm not joking. I really, it's really true. I often think about your houses, you know, the family houses. I've been in a few that are so full of things. And every time I, en- I enter them, in, you know, in the past years, they're always very inspiring because you know that every little piece has a story and, and they come from all around the world and everything. So every time I think, oh my God, it's maybe too much. Then I think about your house. It's like, no, no, I, I'm okay. <laughs> There's harmony. But I think that I think that you can always tell when, even when you're in a space that it's really full and it's not your own space. So you can tell when, when everything is a history and it's jo- not just has been placed there, there's a different harmony when, you know, there's, yeah, that's why I like having things around. It's brings me back to places. There is another aspect of your, of your, your story and the one of your family that I think is very interesting and very, relevant and inspiring in these times. You know, these women of different generations have been leading creatively this this amazing brand. I mean, there was obviously also your grandfather, Ottavio, but uh, your grandmother, your mother, yourself, uh, in, with different roles in different ways. You know, we, we were in a moment where diversity is one of the key topics of conversation, especially in the United States, also in other parts of the world is gender, is ethnicity, and many other forms of diversities as well. I would say, thank God, thank God, you know, finally there is more interest and activism, if you want, to change some, you know, very unjust situations. Uh, what's your point of view on this topic, diversity in general, you know, different kind of diversities, and how, how you've been uh, managing this situation in your life, in your business, how did you deal with what's going on? Um, this is uh, definitely something that it's a process for me because I realized that we're all so much influenced by the culture that we, that's around us, obviously. So, um, I, I grew up thinking that we were, I mean, I never, I never had any conscious racial thought, but I always probably, I also at the same time gave things for granted without putting so much thought into it. Right. So, um, it's definitely a topic that I've devoted a lot of time to at the in the last in the last uh, year or so, and um, I think that, that I mean it's always it's always not restricting it too much because then otherwise we get one against the other. But always keeping open to understanding, to understanding and, and stepping in the other's shoes because um, it's not something immediate for, my, for me in a lot of cases. And then already in the last year or so that I've been devoting my attention to it, my set of mind has made switch and changes that I did not think I needed to make because I thought that I was not a racist at all or that my family was or, not, you know, and I, I still don't think that we are racist that way, but it's not only as we've learned about making like harsh comments about another race, but, you know, about giving, you know, certain specific characterizations and uh, to different ethnic groups. Which, by the way, in the past, not that I've suffered from it at all, and nor you have, but uh, in the past, Italians had gone. I'm reading a book on um, the Spanish flu, okay, okay. which, which was written, <laughs> which was written before COVID. It's super interesting. It's called Pale Rider, okay. 
Okay. And uh, I highly recommend it because it breaks down basically any conspiracy theory that one might have because you really see, read through what's happening now. It's crazy. Um, and there it discusses a lot about like, you know, the, the racism against Italian communities at the time in New York, which was, it was, you know, it had a higher a density than uh, this, you know, Bombay, Bombay's, Mumbai, Mumbai's, uh, most densely populated places. But anyway, not that I've suffered from it at all. So I don't want to put myself as a victim, but I'm just saying in the past, that was something. So, um, I, I completely, I completely, it's a process of learning and I've, I've already learned and I'm glad that my eyes were open on this. I, I, I agree. I, I read a similar book, but it's a different one at the beginning of the pandemic. Oh. I do remember the title and it was also, it was by the way, a photographic book. So okay. there was stories, same racist because the Italian bringing the virus in the U S mm. and then it was interesting to see the um, the waves, the three waves, same thing that happened yeah. this time. I hope there won't be a fourth yeah. one. Uh, there was not a vaccination back then, but also yeah. how people started to go back to life, eventually playing baseball with a mask and going to theaters with a mask. It was very interesting to see the, the full journey uh, to better understand where we are. Often you need to understand the past to better interpret the present and eventually design the future. It's by the way, I'm realizing now that it's also part of your creative process, right? Playing with the past and then projecting. Yeah, but it's, it's very, I mean, for me, the most enlightening thing was, you know, how now we say, well, it's a mysterious, we don't know how, why it affects certain people more than others. And there it was, it was strange. It had specific groups, you know, so it was sparing the 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 50 something but really hitting the 20 something and then and then how on with with you know after years they discovered different uh, they discovered they made new discoveries in medicine that made them understand how that was possible so i'm really wondering what will we discover eventually that will explain for us the you know COVID in the next few years yeah it's it's gonna be interesting well, let's hope to get out of this crisis right now as, as fast yeah. as possible uh, over the years you've been working in your family business but you also uh, proactively got out of the family business and you created your own brand and you're, you've been collaborating with different brands. C can you tell us a little bit about this process? Thinking also about any designer out there that would like to build you know, their own business or their own brands, what should they do? What did you do? Obviously, you had your own situation, that, you know, unique situation, but something that would be inspiring also for other people so, that want to get out. I was stuff. working for us with my mother and for her, and that was really difficult for me. So um, it was challenging. You know, you react to your family members how you would not react to other co-workers. And I decided to step back. I was having my second baby, and I said, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna try something of my own to in order to work. At the times I choose to work, do as much as I want, not more, and then also avoid working with my mother. So I was in a baby bubble and I decided to create a children's clothing line first of my own. And um, so I found a production partner and that's what I did at first. It was called Margarita Kids. And then... Um, from that, right away, I started having proposals from really different uh, and varied um, companies from luggage to children's furniture to bathing suits to jersey, you know, um, actual women's wear. And... Um, so I didn't want a lot of responsibility at the time. And that was a great setup because I was doing the creative. I only had two people working for me 
and they were doing production, development, and distribution, um, which was, you know, it was not as much gain for me as it would have been had I invested, but I did not want to have that burden at the time. And it was great because um, I learned so many, working with such different companies, I learned a lot uh, at different levels on different ways of working, whether it was a production side, whether it was a marketing um, side of it, because always in these collaborations, um, I was involved from a design point of view, but then also from a communication point of view. I was usually also the face of the and uh, the strategist behind the communication. Um, yeah, so um, it was fun until it lasted. <laughs> and then I was called <laughs> back to Miss Sony and I launched M. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, M was recently uh, seized, uh, um, I mean, existing. So yeah. What, what are your plans for the future? You, did you decide yet or you are like, oh, let me relax for a no, second? No, <laughs> I want to relax for a minute and maybe try take advantage of COVID to really like change life. We're discussing like the kids are still young enough that we could take a sailing boat for six months, something mm -hmm. like that before jumping on a new. And also I want to be really like free in my head before I decide to go on a path or in another one. We always have this fantasy of opening a small hotel somewhere. So I would like, I would love to this time in my life have a project, a project with my husband as well, that it's not only a, a financial project, you know, or an investment or a business, but it's a business that Will in, would involve and in, and in our lives, you know, more like a life choice, yeah. Than a I, I love that. They, at, at the end of the day, often people, I think, I mean, some people tend to forget that everything you do at work, your investments, whatever. At the end of the day, hopefully, your intent is to be happy, right? Yeah, you know, exactly. Aiming to that. happiness, and often you. In the process, you forget your final goal, that is to be happy, and you're miserable <laughs> on your journey. And so, also, I think that it's a, if you are, if you do that and you are happy, then you're inspired. We're saying, where is inspiration? That's like the most inspiring. And then you come up with like relevant things that are true to you and not the projection of someone else that put on you. So even if I go in that direction, I don't think that's the end of my creative career. You see that I see it, yeah. I, I, it would be like a start for something, but that's really honest with the person or that I am now. Yeah. So, so what would be your advice to younger talents, creative talent. They could be designer, fashion designers, any kind of designer. It could yeah. be anything else. Imagine you're talking to yourself when you are miserable in those few months, first months in New York City. Uh, what would be your advice for any young talent that, want, that is starting? I always say, really, when I come down to this question, I always say, and I'm going to repeat what I just said before, use your own strengths and be true to yourself. Cause oftentimes, you know, we're, we're put in front of like how others succeeded and what they did. And then we follow in their footsteps because that's a structure that worked, but, um, it worked for them because they really owned it. And because it was right for them, it was their own. Um, and especially, you know, when we have, smaller means, we will not be able to compete with people or with uh, institutions that have, you know, bigger um, means. Uh, so we cannot compete with them on the same, with using the same tools. We have to go our way using different tools. And that's something that, um, yeah, it's always a suggestion that I give. So, you know, for example, in fashion, you want to make it. So 
oh, so you have to do two fashion shows and then you're going to have to do four collections a year because, you know, you have shows and then pre-collections. Then you have to find an agent that sells your collection because and then you have to buy in this department. But then if you cannot sustain that, you're going to close down. And it's a mistake that a lot of people have made because that's the direction they've been pushed. Instead, the ones who thrive, they're the ones who's like, well, I'm not. I'm just going to be selling for my own online or I'm not going to be doing two shows. I'm doing a collection that it's always the same one throughout the, throughout the whole year. And I'm just changing the, you know, and they've gone their own way and then they thrive. Yeah. I, I agree so much. We're all, all looking for our identity, searching our identity, but often we default to the comfort zone of something that is already established and defined. Yeah. Very few people are able or comfortable with getting out in those gray areas and creating their own. Uh, also identity. because those established structures were est- successful in a time, they were established at a time that's a different time than now. So yeah. it's it, maybe yours will become the new establishment eventually. That's the dream. You build the new <laughs> establishment that, that somebody true. in the future will break. We'll have to disrupt. <laughs> and we'll run out of. <laughs> Margarita, thank you so much for this very inspiring thank conversation. You. Thank you, Mauro. See, ciao, Margarita. I hope to see you soon. Ciao, ciao, ciao. Thank you. Ciao.